Okay, Maria, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Give me. Hi, Maria. So we're we're just about to Good. start. Um, hello, everyone okay. who's joined and who's watching us. Sorry for the the late change of uh, YouTube link uh, due to some okay. technical difficulties at our side. Um, okay. Maria, if you just mute your line, just when you're not talking, and we're just waiting for my colleague Natalie uh, to join us as well. Uh -huh. Okay, we should probably get started actually. Natalie can join. Okay. Natalie can join when she can. Okay. So everyone, thank you very much for joining us, and welcome to this um, this webinar uh, on the United Nations General Assembly Special Session. Um, these webinars are a new um, a new venture for IDPC, uh, something to help us communicate with our members and partners in different parts of the world to talk about the young gas. Um, so we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, at any point, um, please feel free to send in any questions or comments that you may have. Um, you can do this either through the the chat function on the YouTube page or on Twitter using the hashtag IDPC webinar. Um, and if you submit your questions that way, then my colleague Juan will pick them up and we'll do our best to answer them um, during the call or at the end of the, at the end of the webinar. So my name's Jamie Bridge. Uh, I'm the Senior Policy and Operations Manager here at the International Drug Policy Consortium um, based in London. Um, and I'm joined on the call by um, IDPC's consultant in Africa, Maria Goretti Anna, who's based in Accra in Ghana, um, and also by Natalie Rose from Pills in Mauritius, who is the Africa and Middle East representative on our strategy committee that we have. Um, so I'm very grateful for those to, for Natalie and Maria to, for helping out with this uh, webinar. And we're going to talk about the young gas. We're going to describe a little bit about the background to the meeting, how we can all get involved, and um, and particularly what the, what the relevance of all this is for Africa and the Middle East. So just a quick word on IDPC. Uh, we are um, a global network of more than 140 civil society organizations around the world. And we basically exist to promote a debate on drug policy, to promote good debates at all levels on drug policy and to make sure that civil society are involved in those debates. And we want to promote drug policies that are based on, on what works, that are based on public health, on human rights, on development, um, and yeah, drug policies that are basically a more humane approach than the one that we've seen around the world over the last 50 or 100 years. So today we're going to cover a lot of ground on the young gas. We're going to talk about what the young gas is. We're going to talk about why it's happening now. We're going to talk about why this is important. And most importantly, we're going to talk about how it is that all of us can engage in this process. So first of all, what is the young gas? The United Nations General Assembly is the highest policy making organ of the United Nations. It really is the top of the tree when it comes to the United Nations system. And at the General Assembly, uh, a member state of the Security Council can, can ask for there to be a special session that focuses on a particular topic. Uh, that topic could be drugs, as you can see from, from the graph in front, but it could also be any topic such as HIV or, or children or development, etc. Um, and in 2016, um, the topic being discussed at a special session will be the world drug problem. And this will be the first one that we've had on drugs since 1998. So these aren't common meetings. You know, this is the first one that we've had for, for a long time. And at the 1998 on gas on drugs, the world came together to talk about drugs and it did so under the banner of a drug-free world, we can do it. And that just kind of helps to um, kind of describe what the frame was like in 1998 when we last had an UNGAS on drugs. And we really hope that um, at the UNGAS next year on drugs that the debate can be a little bit more advanced and progressive than this. We're never going to get a drug-free world. We have to stop trying to get a drug-free world because there's no such thing. So the 2016 UNGAS was requested by the presidents of Mexico, Guatemala, and Colombia. 
and this is important because they are you know arguably the countries that have that have felt the the force of the war on drugs the hardest um, particularly Latin America really has suffered the hardest in this war on drugs, this global war on drugs. So to have three presidents from the region all come forward and say we have to have this debate, we have to have this conversation was an important development. And it was supported by a lot of other countries around the world and it comes at a time when the calls for drug policy reform are higher than they've ever been before. And it's been described as an important opportunity. This is a quote here from the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon who called for this to be a wide-ranging and open debate that considers all the options. So why is it happening now? There's lots of areas in which the consensus that, that is said to exist on drugs, that when it comes to international drug control um, the United Nations likes to talk about a consensus, that the whole world agrees on how to respond. But when we see now that this consensus is at the very least fractured, if not broken, on a lot of key topics. And I'm just going to go through some of those now. The first one is harm reduction. Um, hopefully uh, everyone on the call, uh, everyone on the webinar understands what harm reduction is. But it's a widely endorsed and widely proven approach to drugs, um, basically one which tackles the harms of drug use without necessarily reducing drug use itself. We know from research done by Harm Reduction International that, that this approach is included in the national policies of 91 countries around the world. 90 countries have needle and syringe programs. Um, 80 countries have opiate substitution therapy such as methadone or buprenorphine programs but the coverage of these programs remains incredibly poor and harm reduction is one of the one of the issues at the young gas where the debate rages on because as I, as you can see there's many countries that support this approach but there's many countries that are ideologically um, opposed to it decriminalization is going to be a very very important topic in, uh, at the Young Gas, um, where IDPC and others will be calling strongly for the removal of criminal sanctions for people who use drugs. This is permitted by the drug conventions and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime have confirmed this. You, can't, you do not have to apply criminal sanctions in these cases. And recently it's been, it's been openly endorsed and promoted as um, a positive approach by the World Health Organization, UNAIDS, the United Nations Development Programme, UN Women, the Office of the High Commission on Human Rights and many others. And it, it's not a new approach. We've had decriminalization models in at least 21 countries around the world, most famously in Portugal. Um, where since 2001 they have removed criminal sanctions for, for uh, drug use and personal possession of drugs and that's been very heavily researched and we see that HIV infections have, have gone down, that overdoses have gone down and that crucially that drug use itself has not increased. In a similar vein Libya has been trying for years to amend the conventions to allow them to use coca leaf. Coca leaf being the natural plant that is um, that, from which cocaine is derived. But in Bolivia, coca leaf has a very cultural role to play in society. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural value that it has in the culture there. So Bolivia after spending years with no luck trying to change the conventions eventually took the step of withdrawing from the conventions and then joining again a year after with a reservation that says we agree with the whole convention except for the part on coca leaf and this was a completely legal move this is a move that is completely permitted within the treaty system but was ex described at the time as, as a, a real challenge to the integrity of, of the world drug approach. But it's a really important challenge and, and it's something that other countries may consider in the future as they're looking to reconcile their international commitments on drug control with their human rights commitments and also the, the rights of indigenous people in their country. And then as I'm sure you all know, 
in the last few years we've seen some some really significant advances um, particularly around cannabis and the regulation and legalization of cannabis um, so Uruguay became the first fully regulated national cannabis market in 2013 uh, under the model that they have um, you are allowed to grow uh, a certain number of plants for your own personal use you can also grow plants as part of a syndicate with other individuals and there's also a state controlled market um, in, in cannabis as well and similarly in the USA uh, we've seen um, positive advances in, in a number of states now um, many states have medical marijuana programs um, and or the decriminalization of cannabis but uh, since 2012 we now have regulated markets in four US states and we hope that more will follow in 2016 and we anticipate that there will be a, uh, a major referendum in California in 2016 which will be a very important um, moment for the USA and for cannabis and crucially we see from the, the research, the polls that are being done on, on people's um, opinions of cannabis, the public opinion of cannabis and you can see from this graph that a few years ago was a historic moment where in these, in these large scale surveys more people thought that marijuana should be legal than thought that it should be illegal um, and so we've seen a real shift in, uh, in opinions um, in the USA which, which is an important point to, and, and I think is reflected in many other countries as well. And crucially, we had some, we've had some incredible statements coming out of the USA. Um, the USA obviously being the country that, that really championed the war on drugs um, throughout this, the 1970s and 1980s. Um, but now we hear uh, individuals such as Eric Holder, who was the 82nd Attorney General, we hear him saying that too many Americans are going to prison for far too long and they cannot prosecute or incarcerate their way out of this problem and we've heard many statements like this and, and including statements on, on specifically to drugs saying that, that their approach of um, mass incarceration just simply hasn't worked and doesn't work and they're now looking for an alternative approach so I'm going to hand over now to, to Maria who's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the specific work that's been taking place in, uh, in West Africa as well. So over to you Maria. You might need to unmute your line Maria. You will all recall that in 2014 the West Africa Commission on Drugs launched its groundbreaking report titled Not Just in Transit drugs the state and society in West Africa. The report actually kick-started the debate on drug policy reforms within the region and this commission was convened by Kofi Annan who was so much concerned about the threats of drug use and trafficking within the region. The commission was chaired by the former Nigerian president Olusegu Obasanjo of Nigeria and most of the members were drawn from diverse sectors of West Africa. In carrying its work as a commission, it considered a number of evidence. They did consultations with experts within the region, did cross global consultations. They even visited some of the countries that have been affected most in West Africa before arriving at their findings and evidence-based policy recommendations. Some of the findings of the Commission points to the fact that our current drug policies are not only ineffective but detrimental to the being made to address the threats that, poses by, that are posed by drugs. The Commission therefore called on West African governments to reform laws and policies to address the current issues within the region. The Commission further said that we need to encourage and have the willpower to do what needs to be done. Former, uh, former President Olusegu Obasanjo further emphasized that there was a need for governments to gather the political will to, be, to go after organized traffickers while reforming the outdated laws that we have within our drug policies. And that we need to make sure that these laws that are outdated are reformed 
and that there are laws that do no longer fit reality. He further lamented that many a time the strong and powerful ones are able to slip through the system without being caught. We rather, what we rather do most of the time is that we focus more on the little fries, pursue them in full force with state resources that could possibly be channeled into the health sector to improve the health of the most affected in society. Dr. Mahmoud, a member of the commission, also cautioned that it is important for us to avoid over militarization of drug policies and create because all this creates high costs and they do not reduce drug supply. He further alerted that we must not be the front line of the failed drug, uh, drug law, uh, drug war. This failed war has neither succeeded in reducing drug consumption nor has it put traffickers out of their lucrative business. It only succeeded in driving the market underground and making the traffickers more lucrative in their business. The report instead called for a new approach to drug use and dependence, one that treats it not only as a criminal justice issue, but as a public health issue. Drug use should be treated as a health as a health issue and not just a criminal justice issue. The commission urged that we need to increase the support for people who use drugs. They need help and not punishment because criminalizing people who use drugs only worsens the situation and does not address the problem. I am sure we are all familiar with the popular quote of the general the General Secretary, the former General Secretary of um, the UN, Kofi Annan, who is also a member of the Global Commission, that we might have thought about drugs harming so many people, but bad government poli policies have also harmed many people in our region. It is therefore important that we do not repeat these mistakes by Latin America and the high cost of the drug war, we must be prepared as a region to learn from our mistakes, correct them, and make sure that we reform our laws to address the issues on the ground. I will now pause here and hand over to my colleague, Natalie, to proceed with her presentation. Thank you, Maria. So um, I, will now, I will now talk on uh, why all this is uh, important in our uh, regional context. So um, first of all, uh, as Maria has uh, just um, explained, um, the war on drugs has to end. I will not uh, spend too much time, time on that since she has uh, explained it um, already, but uh, basically um, what we see here is that the drug use has been constantly increasing um, ever since the conventions are uh, on and uh, the, what we also see lately is that also the variety of drugs with the arrival of the uh, new psychoactive substances are also increasing. So the war on drug has to end because it is uh, ineffective. It has also increased all the collateral damage in terms of uh, public health and human rights. So if I have to take an example, um, one in three one in three new HIV infection outside of Sub-Saharan Africa has been caused by needle sharing. And uh, if we have a look at the um, GAP report, we also see that um, Africa is uh, now uh, pretty much uh, concerned with um, uh, HIV rates within the uh, community of people who inject drugs with uh, most countries rating from 10 to 40 percent of prevalence rate among this specific population. Also, the war on drugs has to end because uh, this is a total waste of money. So um, according to Transform, which is um, 
an organization um, based in the UK, uh, but working on international advocacy. The money spent on law enforcement and judicial system, incarceration, etc., amounts to more than 100 billion US dollars each year. So uh, that was the first point. Now, uh, coming to the next point, uh, this is also important because today there is a greater public awareness on the on this subject. Uh, what we have seen is that people are more and more aware of the fact that the war on drugs has brought more harms than good. Civil society organizations have advocated or are, are still advocating in many parts of the world uh, using lobby, using also legal system uh, to question the traditional approach. We have seen this in Mexico last month and we also see, we are also going to see it in South Africa next year. So governments are more and more aware of the need for reform. And uh, there is also now an opportunity for open debate because um, in 2012, uh, the, the member states have asked for UNGAS to be held uh, in 2016, but they have also um, explicitly stated that they wanted the inclusion of uh, civil society inputs uh, in the debates uh, so that they can have their voice. I'm going to mention this a bit later through a uh, task force that have been uh, created. Uh, but also, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, there is also an opportunity for debate uh, at our own uh, national levels. So we can use radio, TV shows, debates, and meet the representative of our uh, respective countries to ask them about the stand on the young gas and share our stand with them and also advocate for more uh, effective uh, drug policies. And. Um, the, the, the next point is that the, the consensus uh, um, are now under threat. Uh, what we are seeing now is that the, I mean, so far, the, the whole drug control system um, has been built on the idea of, of a consensus and the whole world agreeing on how to deal with drugs. Um, but what we see now uh, is that the consensus is um, cracking because uh, in one country, for example, you can face death penalty for cannabis use, and whereas in another country, the same uh, the same action is completely legal. So now the countries cannot agree on most of the points within the consensus, and the actual conventions themselves are looking more and more uh, strained. Although the countries do not really want to talk about the um, conventions conventions now. So uh, the next point I would like to mention is also about the system, the UN system-wide uh, coherent. So what we see is now more and more uh, UN family members have acknowledged the need to have some kind of um, reform on drug policies. I can quote uh, the WHO, UNH, UNODC, UNDP, UN Women. I mean, this has been mentioned uh, already just be before by my colleagues. But uh, what we can see is that the Commission on Narcotic Drugs is not really uh, receptive and more and more isolated. And by doing so, they are hindering the efforts of other UN bodies to make their objective. And this is also undermining other UN pillars such as human rights, health and development. point I would like to mention is also um, uh, the, the need to divert resources from law enforcement into health. As I just mentioned before, we have uh, over 100 billion USD per year, which is spent on enforcing the war on drugs. Um, however, uh, we have heard voices from the international community uh, showing how um, the proper funding of health services for people who use drugs do not need additional funding but much more a reinvestment. Uh, for example, we, we now need a reinvest, re 
investment of only 10% of what is already invent invested in drug law enforcement. This 10%, for example, could fund treatment like um, HIV, hepatitis C that severely hits the community of people who inject and help prevent uh, overdose death, for example. So this policy is more and more important. And um, also, the last point is about the uh, the link between the international um, um, happenings and advocacy uh, back to the national one, because a lot of uh, local and national uh, civil society organizations do not really see how the um, how the ANGAS impacts on our national uh, context. Uh, however, what happens at the global level has a direct impact on the national laws, since most of our uh, national drug laws are based on the uh, conventions. So even if it feels quite distant from us, it is very uh, important. And therefore, as much as there is a direct impact on our local policies, there is also the need to bring the advocacy at the local level by engaging with uh, different partners from uh, governmental to non-governmental organization. So uh, next slide, please. So I would like uh, now to talk about the, um, area, the areas of uh, contention. So uh, the first point, which we have uh, talked already uh, about before, is the fact that people who use drugs should not be criminalized. If we have a look at the UNODC annual World Drug Report, we can see that only one out of ten persons who uses drugs is a problematic user. Yet in our countries, drug policies criminalizes all users, and by doing so, huge amounts of money um, are being spent per year in the enforcement of drug policies, and this is not effective. On the other hand, there are some people who use drugs who are highly dependent on their drug use, vulnerable to HIV, hepatitis C, overdoses and arrests. So a more effective approach would be to remove criminal sanctions for people who use drugs and to respond with a public health and human rights perspective. Also, uh, the harm reduction, which is really an area of contention within the uh, convention and uh, all the documents. So what we want now is uh, we want the uh, term harm reduction to be mentioned in the outcome document from the ANGAS, though we think that it probably will not happen. Um, um, but we also need to start talking uh, not only about harm reduction being in the outcome document of the ANGAS, but also uh, to include the, um, the nine intervention uh, of the uh, UNAIDS, UNODC, and World Health Organization, but also not to limit ourselves to these nine interventions, but to have a broader idea of harm reduction for other other fields like, for example, stimulant users, uh, people who use drugs but who don't necessarily inject inject drugs, and also for uh, reducing the harms uh, that people like farmers and producers uh, can uh, face. So harm reduction should really be an approach for other kind of checklist of services. Because what we can see is that if these services are incorporated in a health system that is uh, situated within a repressive legal framework, uh, this cannot work. For example, this can lead to arrest of people who come on needle and, and syringe program just because there is no connection between law enforcement and public health. The next part is the proportionality of sentences. So uh, what we are advocating for, of course, is that uh, the death penalty is not used anymore for drug-related offenses. And this is a real area of contention because members still largely disagree on, on the death penalty for drug-related offenses. But what we see in reality is that people who are arrested, incarcerated, and sometimes um, there are sometimes, uh, depending on the country where they are, where, where this is happening, they can be sentenced to the capital punishment. 
But what we see in reality is that these people are often vulnerable people, like mules or users who sell small amount of drugs to sustain their own drug use. And this is very unlikely that drug barons, like big drug barons, are called incarcerated and undergo trial. Also, what we have seen in some areas is that, like Latin America, for example, where it's mostly um, uh, vulnerable women who are caught uh, when they are um, uh, acting as mules. And uh, it's mostly women who are uh, caught and incarcerated. And uh, so the least we can ask is that uh, we there is a removal of death penalty so that the sentence is proportionate uh, to the to the to the offense. The next point is about the uh, essential medicine. So um, this point is, uh, I think, even more important for our developing countries because um, access to pain medication like opiates, morphine, for example, uh, within our health system is, a, is an important aspect of the uh, pain management system of our public health. Oftentimes, when these substances are scheduled within the convention, the access is hindered by complex and often costly distribution mechanism. Another concrete example that we see is the access to methadone, because today, and Jamie did mention that before, out of 158 countries that report injecting drug use, half of them still do not offer this treatment. So it is thus important that the prohibitive approach do not hinder access to essential medicine. I will now hang over to uh, Maria. Thank you. Um, under this slide, we'll basically be looking at um, Africa's representation and how that has affected a lot of discussions around the international drug policy debates. Um, Africa representation in the ongoing international drug policy debate at the United Nations in Vienna has been a challenge for some time now. And this, I will say, stems from the fact that a large number of African countries have no permanent diplomatic or they don't have staff present or stationed in Vienna. So this more or less largely accounts for the absence or the silent voice of Africa in Vienna and its deliberations. And it further points to the constant absence and unaware of most of the discussions that have been going on in Vienna. Over a time now, um, there seems to be a low engagement allowing a few countries who more or less dominate the proceedings and speaking on behalf of the Africa group in Vienna and significantly a group like Egypt, South Africa have been very um, frequent and very dominant in the discussions in Vienna. This low level engagement and the silent voice of most of the countries have, have actually come to confirm what is happening currently with the African common position that was developed by member states, um, which is supposed to be the official statement or official position for the ONGAS outcome document. I will want to take our listeners briefly through how the African, the common African position was developed. This dates back to um, the safe conference of African ministers in charge of drugs control in October 2014 in Addis Ababa, where a declaration was made to scale up balance and integrated responses towards um, drug control in Africa. And this declaration was approved by almost about 30 plus AU member states present in that particular meeting. And this declaration was actually a call upon the African Union Commission to facilitate 
the discussions and the engagement towards a common position. The AU Commission by its Social Affairs Department worked closely with a wide range of civil society partners and because of its inclusive approach, it saw active involvement of African governments to develop this common position. After its development, it was presented for further debate and consultations at the AU Specialized Technical Committee on Health, Population, Drug Control in April 2015 in Addis Ababa. Further to that, it was sent out to member states for inputs, after which it was finalized, forwarded to the current chair, which is South Africa, for submission to the ONGAS chair. Sadly, South Africa submitted something apparently drafted by Egypt on behalf of the Africa group. This came as a surprise to a whole lot of people, member states that were involved in the drafting. And I must say that some countries like Ghana have petitioned what has taken place currently by submitting the Africa group position instead of the Ghana, um, the African common position. I will want to now go through the various submissions that have been made by the two groups. That's the African Union position drafted by member states and the submission that was made by the Africa group that was filed by um, South Africa. Basically, when you look at the, um, the African group, that's the AU position, the position clearly states that the object of drug policy is to improve health and well-being. Whereas the South Africa group, they submitted what has actually been submitted, calls for reaffirmation of the target to eliminate drugs by 19, that's 2019, meaning a call for more war on drugs. The AU's position further calls for a balance between supply, demand, and harm reduction. Even though the submitted position also calls for a balance on supply and demand reduction, it is completely silent on harm reduction. There is no mention of harm reduction in its submission, which is a bit worrying. AU's position seeks to ensure that there is a provision of essential medicines. And this position by the AU also cuts across in the submitted position, but the submitted position goes further to call for stricter control on ketamine and tramadol, which is an issue that is a little bit worrying to people who are into advocacy. And we have been talking about evidence-based policies, we should promote evidence-based policies within our region. While AU is calling for drug use to be considered as a public health problem and pursue alternatives to punishment of minor offenses, the submitted position seems to condemn that position and describes it as a misguided policy that will hinder ongoing efforts. AU position is also calling for resource allocation for treatment. And I must say that till date, the AU's position has still not been formally submitted into the ONGAS preparations. And it will be very important that as a continent, for us to be able to move forward, it is important that the African Union's common position is formally submitted and considered as part of the ONGAS preparations in order to acknowledge the consensus building and the work that lies ahead of us. 
And it will be very important for the Africa group as well to clarify the processes behind the submission and ensure that there is transparency and inclusiveness and in the decision making process. AU's position was developed by our member states. Inputs were made by member states. However, the submitted position, nobody knows how that was developed, who was consulted, who was involved in the development of this process. It is very important for us as a continent to address these issues and be able to move forward so that when we go to ONGARDS, we will move to ONGARDS with a common voice and with one voice. I will want to now hand over to my colleague to proceed from this level. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. That was, that was great. And thank you, Natalie, as well. Um, so before we go into the next section, which will talk a bit more about how people can engage, um, I just want to answer or try and answer some of the questions that people have uh, asked on Twitter and on the YouTube chat. Um, so firstly, uh, one of the questions is why is reform so slow in Africa and is it because of stigma? I, I would definitely say that stigma plays a, a big role in this. Um, I think the whole discussion around drugs um, is uh, it, it's in need of some progress in, in Africa and in the Middle East as well. There's a lack of awareness, I think this is crucial, there's, there's a real lack of awareness amongst the public as well as amongst politicians um, of what the alternatives are and a lack of awareness of the, the evidence that's out there, both the evidence of um, what the harms of the current approach are and the evidence of what works. And I think that's a really important thing that we've all got to do together is to try and get this message out there clearer and try and get this evidence out there. And then as Maria explained, there's also a real lack of engagement for a range of reasons a real lack of engagement in the global debate um, and I mean I saw one of the comments uh, saying that the Africa group cannot be taken seriously I mean there are there are big concerns that we have around how much the Africa group in Vienna and Vienna is where all the drug conversations take place at the UN um, you know we have big concerns about how much the Africa group truly represents the, 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 the different countries of, of the continent um, Another question we received was, are there programs available to educate African leaders on reform? Um, the West Africa Commission on Drugs is, is a great example of, of efforts to try and educate leaders. And the commissioners have, have done a series of country visits to reach out to, to, to political leaders, to politicians, to policy makers, to try and convince them of the need for reform. But I'm not aware of, of anything similar taking place in other, in other parts of Africa. And we are having conversations now about do we need an East African Commission on Drugs? Or do we need a South African Commission on Drugs? Or do we need a Middle East and North African Commission on Drugs? Um, I think that is part of the work that still has to be done. We have to reach out to the policy makers and and tell them what our what our opinions are and tell them what our arguments are um, and another question we received was about the single convention the UN single convention which is the first drug convention uh, in 1961 how can that be considered valid when the USA and Uruguay and other countries are contravening it I mean it's interesting that the USA and Uruguay both argue that they are not breaking the convention um, and the USA recently has been talking a lot about flexibility with the convention and how the convention needs to be interpreted flexibly. Um, I mean we would argue that, that that's not actually a correct analysis um, but the, the most important thing is that the countries do not want to talk about rewriting the conventions. They are afraid of doing that, they are worried that they won't be able to come to an agreement about what the new convention should look like um, they are trying to do everything they can to stifle that debate and to not talk about a new set of conventions. Instead, they want to talk about um, kind of sticky plasters, things that just patch over the problem rather than fix it. Um, so it's a really, really good point, but it's one of the issues that we're hoping will come up at the Young Gas, um, although we're not expecting the Young Gas to be the meeting where they decide to rewrite the conventions, obviously. 
Um, so I'll just move on quickly um, with the other slides about how how to engage and, and just firstly talk about what is happening now. So the Young Gas takes place in April in New York um, and so we're currently in the negotiations um, or sorry the governments rather are, are currently negotiating about the process for that meeting. Who gets to speak, when they get to speak and that includes civil society speakers. We're arguing that civil society needs to have a very strong voice at this meeting and so do UN agencies, so do scientists and researchers. We have to make sure that all these people are able to attend the meeting and have their voice heard. The question is whether there's more meetings take place in New York rather than happening just in Vienna because as Maria has explained many African countries just don't actually have any staff in Vienna. They don't have a mission in Vienna so they're physically unable to follow this debate. And crucially, they're now working on the document that will come out of the Young Gas. So at the end of the Young Gas meeting, there will be a, a document that every country agrees to. Um, the chances are that that document will actually be written in advance. Um, they've already kind of started that process, and um, IDPC are following it very closely. Um, and that outcome document will try to summarize the things that the world can agree on with drugs and as Natalie mentioned because it because every country has to agree it looks unlikely that harm reduction will be in that document because some countries oppose that approach it looks unlikely that the death penalty will be in that document because there's some countries just don't want to talk about that issue um, so the outcome document itself may not contain everything that we want it to have but what we're looking forward to is the actual debate that takes place at the meeting. Now in terms of how to kind of engage in this, um, there's many ways that you can try and follow this debate and one of the roles that IDPC tries to play is to communicate what is happening at the United Nations level and to try and make it accessible for our partners around the world um, including in Africa. So you can go on our website, um, idpc.net, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website and you can, um, you can get the latest information from there. And every time that we attend a United Nations meeting, we also do a blog from that meeting. So you can go on cndblog.org and you can actually find out exactly what every country said at the United Nations. So you can find out what your country is saying at these meetings if they're there at all. There's many networks and groups that you can join it to engage in this debate and actually one of the questions that we've had um, on the chat is is there any umbrella groups or networks um, of African organizations? I'm not aware of a specific network for the whole of Africa but just to give some examples we have the Middle East and North Africa Harm Reduction Association or MINARA and uh, organizations from that part of Africa can, can join MINARA. There's also a West Africa Civil Society Drug Policy Network um, which is open, they're very open to, to, um, to new organizations from West Africa joining them. There are, there are discussions about uh, the creation of an East African Harm Reduction Network. Um, there's a global fund proposal which is due to start in 2016 so hopefully there will be a network for that part of the part of Africa as well and then in South Africa there's currently no sub-regional network but we'd be very interested in working with our partners there to try and set something up because I think it's much needed in South Af in southern Africa um, but also you can join some of the global groups so you can join the Vienna network um, the Vienna NGO committee on drugs or VNGOC um, that's open to organizations around the world who are engaged in drugs issues and they are the they are the voice of civil society in the UN discussions in Vienna and then similarly there's a sim there's another group called the NYNGOC um, based in New York that perform the same function but in the UN discussions in New York so both of those organize both of those organizations um, you can join them 
um, you can go on their websites and find out more about them. And that's another really good way to, to kind of stay more involved in these uh, debates. And then at the national level, it's important that local partners help us to raise awareness and that's both raising awareness of the general public, of the media, but also the policy makers. And trying to build alliances, so um, try and reach out to organizations, for example, um, HIV organizations or human rights organizations in your country, to try and get them to focus on drugs as well. Because what we might find is that some of these organizations have a lot of capacity and a lot of good connections with government, but they're not talking about drugs because they just don't consider it part of their work. Um, you can find out, crucially, who attends the debates from your country. So a really good place to start, if you want to find out who from your country goes to the United Nations and, and takes part in these debates, um, you can contact us at IDPC. We um, can send you a list of who was at the last um, UN meeting on drugs in March. And from that list, you can find out which department of government it is that attends, which individuals it is who goes. And that gives you a really good starting place in terms of who do you try and contact and who do you try and meet. And that should help you to try and reach out to your government and just speak to your government. Um, in the UK, for example, we now have regular meetings. So before a UN meeting on drugs, there'll be a smaller meeting in London where the relevant government agencies will meet with some of the key civil society groups to talk about their positions and to talk about what's what's going to happen in that meeting. And it would be great to try and build a similar relationship with some of the governments in, in Africa and the Middle East. And, and also it's important to define what it is you're asking for. Um, I mean, hopefully we've given you some ideas on this call. Um, but it's important that you have your own requests that you are, um, you know, based on your own local needs and your own local kind of issues um, in your country. And finally, one option that is open to all of us and to all organizations around the world is we can make formal submissions. We can, we can put down on paper what it is we believe drug policy should be and you can submit that um, to the UNGAS website itself, uh, which is up on the screen, which is ungas2016.org. There's a, a link there for civil society um, uh, submissions, and you can see there all the submissions that have been made by groups around the world, including IDPC. Um, the West Africa Commission on Drugs have submitted their report, and every organization is, is, is um, encouraged to submit their own reports onto that, onto that website as well. And just to, just to clarify some of the asks, um, the IDPC network um, did uh, put some effort in a few months ago to, to try and define what our asks are. What is it that we want from the UNGAS? And we came up with the following ones. First of all, it has to be an open debate, as we've talked about. It has to be a debate that resets the objectives of drug policy. So drug policy should no longer be about criminalization. It should no longer be about how many people you've arrested or how many drugs you've seized. Instead, we need to measure the success of drug policy in terms of HIV transmission or overdose deaths. Can we impact on those? And can we impact on the drug markets that way? We need to support new approaches. We need to talk about and, and review and do evaluations of what's happening in Uruguay, in the USA, in Portugal and elsewhere. Crucially, and we've mentioned this before, we've got to end the criminalization of drug users because it, does, it just does no one any good. It only makes the problem worse. And part of this, we have to ensure proportionate penalties for all drug offenses. We have to end the death penalty. No drug offence deserves the death penalty. And we have to make sure that the response that we have, the legal response that we have to drugs, is proportionate to the seriousness of the offence. And finally, as we've mentioned before, we've got to redirect our attention and redirect our funds towards health instead of criminal justice and towards harm reduction approaches. So there are the asks that IDPC have put together, but we encourage you to, to look at this. You can download this document from the IDPC website. We encourage you to look at it, but to also think about what your specific asks are for your country. 
Um, and just on this issue of how to engage, I'm going to hand over now to Natalie, who's going to talk a bit more about a specific group that has been created for the young gas. Thank you, Jamie. So uh, I would like to talk about the um, civil society task force that has been created um, as an official official mechanism for the um, engagement of civil society at the young gas. So uh, this um, task force has been created to serve as official li liaison between uh, the United Nations and civil society in the preparatory process of the young gas and at the young gas itself uh, next year. And the objective is to ensure com comprehensive, structured, meaningful and balanced participation of CSO during the whole process. So uh, in terms of uh, representation to how who is um, part of this uh, task force? The, um, the task force is made up of uh, 26 members representing nine different regions and four affected populations. So these different members represent uh, the uh, drug free organization, the uh, organization that are pushing more for the harm reduction and uh, drug policy reform approach. The, we have drug user drug users group. Uh, representation, uh, palliative care movement, and uh, also the farmers of uh, illicit crop. So um, the um, role also of the of the task force is to offer um, recommendation for the ANGAS based on the um, inputs of civil uh, of uh, civil society. Uh, so this is done following consultation with uh, civil society organization from different countries of each region and it has also been done with through a global online survey that was on um, till July I, I think this year. So of course this represents a very broad range of views but all these different approaches will be summarized in a report that will be sent to the young gas um, as the official paper representing civil society organization views on the world of problem for the uh, for the young gas. So it, uh, another function of the uh, task force is also to uh, organize um, civil society hearings. So the next one is scheduled for the 10th of uh, February uh, next year in the uh, in the Angas. And also uh, another um, function uh, of the task force will be um, when uh, we will be at the Angas, I mean just prior to the Angas, uh, this task force will have to identify speakers for the Angas debates in April in New York at the Angas. So uh, thank you and I will hand over to Jamie who will now talk about the um, uh, support on Punish campaign. Excellent. Well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep that slide up just for a second because we're, I just want to answer a few more of the questions that have come in. Um, we're running out of time, so we won't be able to answer every question, but we're, we, um, we, I just want to um, try and address a few of them. And thank you very much for, for taking such an active part in this webinar. Um, so the first one is uh, the first one I have here is what are the reasons why the Africa Group position was so different from the Africa Union position? And I mean, the simple answer to that is it's it's written with a different ideological perspective. I mean, the Africa Group position we believe was drafted by the Egyptian mission, um, so it very much reflects Egypt's positions on the key issues, particularly around uh, putting stricter controls on ketamine and tramadol. And we, are, as far as we are aware, there is very little consultation done with other. Uh, governments around Africa. Whereas the Africa Union position reflects the discussions that they've had with member states um, over a series of, uh, o over a, a long time, over several years actually, as part of their work on drugs. And um, so the Africa Group, the Africa Union position is, is I would argue, more of a consensus uh, approach because different countries sent their comments and, and made edits and changed that document and eventually every country was, was happy with that document. But what eventually happened was, was that South Africa submitted something completely different but was drafted 
using a much more closed approach and was drafted with with uh, a real ideological uh, purpose. Um, so that's really why it's happening. And one of the other questions is, are the Africa Union countries criticizing this? Well, as Maria mentioned, uh, we know at least of one country, Ghana, that have made a formal complaint about what's happened. Um, we know that there's many other countries who are unhappy with, with what has happened and are asking questions of the Africa group and of South Africa and saying, well, why, why hasn't the Africa Union position been submitted? So this is, this is something that's ongoing. I still really hope that the Africa Union will submit their position. Um, and this is an ongoing piece of work to try and make sure that all that work, all that effort to create that document doesn't get wasted. Um, and one more quick question is, is how can I attend the discussions as a civil society organization from Africa? Um, we are still trying to uh, find out what the process is for civil society groups to be able to attend the UNGAS itself in New York. Um, for the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, um, any organization that is registered with the United Nations can attend and IDPC can also support other groups to attend by helping to facilitate, we can give you a pass for the building if you don't have the, the correct registration as an organization. So logistically we can help and I would encourage you to, to as I say, follow the debate on the IDPC website and to, and to contact us. Um, if you're interested in attending. Um, obviously the big question is funding, you know, how can you get the funding to attend? Um, and that would, you know, you'd have to identify um, donors in your region or country who would be willing to support that because uh, um, it's obviously, it, it's quite expensive to fly over to New York and to fly over to Vienna for these meetings. Um, and because of that, one of the things that we do is to try and make the meeting accessible for people who can't be there. So even if you can't attend those debates, you can still be a part of this discussion. Um, and I think that's something I really wanted to, to emphasize. And then the last question that I think we have time for um, is, it says, what about the UNODC paper on decriminalization? Um, so for those who aren't aware of this, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime drafted a position paper um, supporting the decriminalization of uh, drug use and they released that um, at the harm reduction conference in Malaysia um, uh, a few months ago but then just before it was due to be released they, they withdrew it and changed their mind um, but the document was leaked anyway and there was lots of media coverage about this position so so we had this document, we know that they were looking to launch it, we're working very closely with them um, and the latest information that we have is that they are still planning to launch a position paper before the UNGAS that, that makes it clear that UNODC supports decriminalization in the same way that the World Health Organization already does, that UNAIDS already does and that lots of other UN agencies already do. So again as soon as that is released we will put it on our website and we will put it on our Facebook page and our Twitter page and we will make sure that as many people get to see that document as as possible. Um, so just before we finish uh, I just wanted to mention um, another way that you can engage in this debate which is a campaign that IDPC runs called Support Don't Punish uh, which hopefully many of you will have seen before. Um, and Support and Punish is, is a campaign that anyone can take part in. I would encourage you to visit our website, which is on the screen now. Um, and one easy way to take part is to be a part of this photo project. And you can see some of the photos in front of you. And um, you can just take your photo with the campaign logo, send that to us at campaign at idpc.net, and you'll become part of this movement and you'll become part of... Um, of the campaign. Um, we have around 7,000 photos at the moment and it would be great to get 10,000 photos in time for the young gas and to, to display these somewhere in New York to make it to show people that there's such support out there for a change in drug policies. Um, so on that note, uh, I'm going to close the webinar but uh, thank you very much to, to Natalie and to Maria for your support and your contribution. Um, and also, crucially, thank you to those of you who have joined the webinar. Um, please do get in touch. Uh, if you have any other questions, we want to try and help as best as we can. 
um, and uh, we'll let you know if, if we do do another one of these meetings in the future. So thank you very, very much and um, have a, a nice remainder of the day.